to Pastor John at James River and to Pastor Jake at the village, Pastor Les at Robius Hall. God is good. And all the time? Well, I just found this article the other day from Career Builder in which they have collected the most unbelievable excuses bosses have heard from their employees this year about how they called in and said, I can't come to work because. I don't have time to share all of them with you, so I've chosen just the top seven. I can't come to work today because, number seven, I just put a casserole in the oven. Now, listen, I, I'm not made these up. These are real. These are reported from bosses. Number six, I cannot come to work because, you see, I was sitting in the bathroom and my feet and my legs fell asleep, and when I got up, I broke my ankle. <laughs> Number five, I've been in the casino all weekend, and I still have money left. I'm not coming in to work. <laughs> Number four may be one of my favorite. It said, I can't come into work today because I'm in a good mood, and I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> Number three, I can't come into work today because I got my arm stuck in the blood pressure cuff at the grocery store. Is that, you know it's happened to you. I can't come into work today because I caught my uniform on fire. I put it in the microwave to dry it. And number one, the best ever, I cannot come into work today because I accidentally got on a plane. At one point in Tolstoy's novel, War and Peace, the main character, Pierre, uh, comes to terms with himself in reflection, and he has to deal with who he is and what's going on in his life. And so he makes this statement that really I, perhaps is my statement, and you may choose to own it yourself, when he says, quote, Yes, Lord, I have sinned but I have several excellent excuses. Can I get a witness? So let me ask you this morning, a little spiritual aerobics. Raise your hand if you made some New Year's resolutions. Anybody? Okay, raise your hand if you've already broken at least one of those. Yes. Raise your hand if you'd like a do-over. Would you like a do-over? And let's begin right now. So I'm hereby declaring New Year's Day resolutions begin now. And in case you don't have one, I'm going to offer you one. That if you're willing to take this resolution on, it will be the resolution to end all resolutions. You won't need another resolution, ever. Are you ready? So the resolution for this year, 2016, if you agree to it, is this. No more excuses. No more excuses. If you think about that for just a moment... Any and everything you've ever tried to commit to before, resolved to do before, fell back because at some point you and I made a, an excuse and didn't get it done. So I'm offering to you no more excuses. But just so we understand this, let's look at this in the context of our discipleship, our, our faith to church, the bride of Christ. It's where we are. We're meeting in our community of faith known as church. And so let's look a little bit about excuses perhaps you've said, you've heard, or you may not ever believe that someone could ever say to a pastor, these have all been said, if not to me, to a friend of mine, and I've collected them for you. So what about church attendance? Well, here's some excuses when it comes to church attendance. I go when I can, but I'm not always able. Here's another. I can worship God. Anywhere, the golf course, the mountainside, the lake, I don't have to go to the facility to worship God. But this is my favorite one. I don't go to church and this is my reason. If I go some of the time, it makes me want to go all the time. <laughs> and since I can't go all the time, it makes me feel guilty when I miss some of the time. So I don't go any of the time and that keeps me from feeling guilty about wanting to go all the time. <laughs> you can't make that up. By the way, one of the latest polls shows that 40% of Americans would describe themselves as faithful, having a relationship with God, and attend church regularly. Uh, now, they underline that word regularly, and they put a little asterisk by it, and you go down to the bottom, and it asks for, or it gives us then, their detail of what regular means. Three out of every eight Sundays. So 40% of Americans who call themselves faithful in church attendance, what they're saying is, yes, I go at least three out of eight times. 
No more excuses. When it comes to tithing, maybe you've heard it, maybe you've said it, I can't afford to tithe. When I get a raise, then I will tithe. The favorite one I ever heard, though, was this fellow that came up and said, Oh, preacher, you know, that tithing business, that's an Old Testament principle, and I'm a New Testament believer. I said, you might want to back up on that because in the Old Testament, he only asked for 10%. In the New Testament, he asked for it all. His eyes about popped out of his head. I said, you're not familiar with Jesus who died and gave it what? All. He didn't say 10% for you and for me. Anyway, no more excuses. How about when it comes to attending Sunday school or small groups or discipleship groups? You've heard it said, perhaps others have said, that's my only day to sleep in. I can't make that commitment. Worse yet, I have this fear that if I go and commit to one of those, they're going to ask me to read or pray out loud. I don't do that, preacher. Someone said, well, I've got enough friends already. Someone else said, well, I just really can't make that kind of life commitment uh, at my young age. You see, a small group, he said, is like a timeshare. Once you're in, you never get out. Make it, brother, sound like prick a prison, doesn't he? No more excuses. When it comes to singing in the choir or uh, playing an instrument, being a part of the praise team, I've, I've heard this a million times. Oh, they don't need me. Others have said, well, I'd love to sing or play, but I don't like to practice or I don't like the choice of music that they do. Mm, no more excuses. How about when it comes to making changes in the church? Well, it's been good enough for me and my parents. It ought to be good enough for all those coming in. And if it's not, then they can find another church to go to. It's an excuse not to change. Another excuse for changes in church structure or facilities or the programming, it's going to cost too much money. Others then say the ultimate thing is, you know, if you do that, they are going to leave. Yeah. They who? <laughs> you mean you? When it comes to witnessing, sharing our story. Well, I, I, I'm afraid I will defend someone. Well, I, I'm afraid they might ask me a question that I don't know the answer to. We, we pay our church staff to do that. No more excuses. When it comes time to respond to what the Lord is asking you to do, commanding you to do, nudging you to do in the pneuma nudge. Excuses? Well, mm, I must be really tired and emotional. If I just wait here long enough, this will pass. Someone would say, well, I can't get up and go talk to the pastor. Everybody in there will think something's wrong with me. I don't need to move or tell anybody what's going on with me. I, I, can, I can do that right here in my chair. That's between me and the Lord. No more excuses. When it comes to gossip in a church, the one thing that has probably ruined and destroyed more churches than I would care to tell you about, someone says their excuse for gossiping, well, I'm just sharing what everybody else already knows. How about this one? I'm not saying anything to you that I wouldn't say to their face. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> but my favorite is this one. Gossip? I won't tell anything about another person unless it's good. And boy, is this good. <laughs> no more excuses. Up until three months ago, I had heard this from someone in faith community very close by. Well, we're waiting to see who the senior pastor is and then we'll decide if we're going to make a commitment. I'm here. <laughs> could we go on? Yes, we could. Spending time daily with Jesus in Bible study and reading. When it comes to seeking reconciliation and forgiveness from others, you know the excuse. Oh, I'll forgive them if they come say they're sorry. Excuses when it comes to welcoming and reaching out to visitors to people you don't know, especially if they're sitting in your seat. Excuses when it comes to going on a mission trip, sacrificing in some other way. Let me ask you this morning as we're talking about this New Year's resolution of no more excuses. You want to know what God has to say about our excuses? He sees right through them. He sees right through them. The parable in Luke 14 this morning. A man is giving a great banquet. And it's not even a potluck. You don't have to bring anything. Just show up. The party's for you, he says. So he sends out the invitations and back come the responses. Without the haunting line in verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. They didn't all make the same excuses, but they all alike made excuses. 
the farmer. Well, I, I bought a field. I, I, I've got a business responsibility. I need to go check it out. Please excuse me. The cattleman, I've just bought some uh, oak and yoxen, uh, uh, oxen and, and yoke, and so I need to go make sure that's going to work all right. And the third man, bless his heart, he just said, I, got, I just got married. You know I can't come. Now, I don't know if that's because he wanted to stay with her or she just said, you can't go. I don't know. <laughs> the interesting thing here, friends, is that in those excuses, I do not want this to pass you by. None of these excuses are sinful. Not a one of them. Not any of these things that people said, the reason why I cannot come is this. They're not sinful in and of themselves. There's nothing wrong with buying land or animals or machinery to work the land. The Bible commends enterprise and hard work. And of course, that's the first two and the one about marriage. Well, my goodness, the, the Bible certainly supports love and family and the marriage. It com commends it to us in the Bible. But the point is, in all of this, that those things are legitimate in their rightful place. But the moment they can become wrong is when they hinder us from getting right with God. When we hold up a good thing rather than going to enjoy the better thing. The better thing is the invitation from God who says, I'm throwing you a party, it's a feast, it's a banquet, I want you to come, it's a buffet like you've never experienced before, won't you come? And so we choose to do a good thing instead of the best thing. You see, good things, wrongly emphasized, can take us down a wrong turn as easily as sinful things. And this is something that's frightening to me. It's not so much that at times I don't have to, to fight the sinful things that I want to do, but there's also these other things that I'll let creep in the way of God's best for me. And this story has some truths for me and for you. I don't know about you. My confession to you is I can make excuses for anything I want to do or not do. My wife just said amen up on the front row. <laughs> the sad part of this story is that God sees through every one of those excuses. And what happens is we give up the opportunity to have the best that God wants for us in our lives. Listen, this is not new. This is a default mode in our humanity. It's been happening since day one of creation in the Garden of Eden where everything was perfect. They broke down and made some bad choices and then began to get, give excuses. Adam blamed Eve. Well, as a matter of fact, really he blamed God first. If you go back and God said, well, now who told you you were naked? Who let you in on all this? Did you eat from the tree? And Adam says, well, that woman you gave me as if he gave a bad model or something. She made me eat. And then she turns immediately and says, well, it's not my fault. The devil made me do it. Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. I love that story of the woman who went out and bought an, an exquisite dress and the price was exquisite, way over their budget. Got home, showing it to her husband and he got so mad. He said, what are you doing? Why could, how could you do that? She said, well, honey, I, the devil made me do it. He said, well, why didn't you just say, Satan, get behind me? She said, I did. He said, it looked as good from the back as it did from the front. <laughs> so, ladies, you can't use that excuse anymore. <laughs> Listen, God sees through all of our excuses. Well, there's some good news that comes with this. And that is he really doesn't want to hear our excuses. What he wants is transformation. What he wants is for you and for me to get beyond the lip service of talking about why we didn't and let's just go do what he's asking us to do. You go back to the story in the gospel, Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son comes to his daddy, reminds him, I, it's my money, give me what's mine now, my inheritance. The father gives it to him, he goes off and he blows it. He blows it in a faraway land and while he's sitting there in a pig pen, when he's lost it all, all of his friends, all of his money, he says, I need to go home. My, the servants at home are living better than I. Maybe my daddy will let me come back and be a servant. And so he practices on his way home the confession. But when the father runs down to the end of the driveway and meets his son with open arms, this kid opens his mouth and his daddy says, I don't even want to hear it, son. I'm just glad you're home. I don't think God wants to hear my excuses either but he is willing to celebrate when I move 
in his direction and receive the kingdom of God. John 10.10 10 says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundant. Friends, you can't have abundance if you don't show up to the party. And the party is the feast. It just dawned on me. I was, uh, I, I, Paul and I, going to our first church in, in Roanoke, Virginia, and we'd never had that experience of being interviewed, and we were being introduced to the church, and we were down in the fellowship hall, and before we knew what had happened, they put two chairs in the middle of the floor, and they had uh, surrounded us on the outside of the wall. I leaned over to Paul and I said, this is what the Lone Ranger felt like. But anyway, and so they started asking us questions. I thought, this is normal. This is the way you interview your, you know, your next pastor. And so questions came and, uh, I mean, I did well. I made up stuff that I could and just, you know. <laughs> anyway, this guy says, hey, I got a question. How long are you going to stay? I thought, well, I'm not even here yet, but that's, but he did. He said, how long are you going to stay? What was interesting about that is I think the Lord gave me that answer because something was tied into my theology about walking with God. And that is that walking with God is meant to be a feast, a party, a banquet, fulfilling, abundant. And so I said to him, I'm going to stay here as long as it's fun for me. When it's not fun for me, I need to go. I'm going to stay here as long as it's fun for you. When it's not fun for you, I need to go. It occurs to me, friends... Faith followers, an invitation is being extended to you and to me today. The resolution of all resolutions, no more excuses. No more. Will you pray with me? And to these old moments, O oh God, may we allow your Holy Spirit to roam freely, to have its will and its way, as it convicts, as it nudges, as it pushes, as it silently speaks to us, or maybe shouting in a thunder to us. Dear God, at this moment, even as you were nudging and calling and demanding and commanding and convicting, let us stop making excuses and come before you with faithfulness. And come before you with a movement toward you, God, to receive your invitation. It may be the invitation to receive you as Lord and Savior for the very first time. Do not leave where you are sitting today without making that decision. If you've never received Jesus into your heart and life, do this before you leave today. If the Lord stirs you to come and deal with him on bended knee at the altar, come. Come, start this new year. Right. No more excuses. Maybe it is to commit to, to be a part of the faithful fellowship of where you're worshiping right now. To come and say, I, I, I want to be a part of this. God is telling me I need to be here with other believers to be equipped for where he wants to take me. Lord, it's your invitation. It's not mine. Find us faithful, which means no excuses. And all God's people said,